Okay, in this video, we're going to try our hand at making a pineapple orange mellow mill using, of course, pineapples, an orange, and some orange blossom honey. You now, a few other ingredients, but basically, those are the main ones. Hi, I'm Charles, and welcome to DIY Fermentation, your site for doing fermentation on a shoestring budget. To make our pineapple orange mellow mill, we will be using the following. We're using two to two and a half pineapples. I'm going to be using a Red Star Premier Blanc wine yeast for this particular one. Two and a half pounds, or in this case, 2.6 pounds of orange blossom, 100% raw honey. Two oranges, one of which we are going to zest, but we are going to use the juice of both. About a tablespoon of brown sugar. About half a cup of chopped raisins. One black tea bag which we'll make about a half a cup of black tea with, which is going to be our tannin substitute. We're going to use the juice of one half of one lemon, which is going to act as our acid blend substitute. We'll need enough water to give us up to one gallon of total measure. We'll need something to do primary fermentation in, preferably something with a wide mouth opening so we can get in our straining bags. We'll need something to do secondary fermentation in because after about five to seven days in primary, we need to rack it into our secondary container. This container just happens to be used at the moment with a strawberry mead, which I'm going to probably bottle before the end of primary is done. So I'll be using that jug, Timmy John, carboy, take your pick. I'm going to need an airlock with stopper. The primary fermenter already has a built-in airlock, so I won't need one for that. I will need a couple of straining bags to hold all of our fruit while in primary. A hydrometer to let us know our starting gravity and our ending gravity so we can tell how much alcohol we've produced. And last but certainly not least, our sanitizer of choice, whether you're using Star Sand or One Step or whatever. Make sure that all of your equipment has been cleaned and sanitized, ready for use. No problems later on. And that's what I'm going to be using to make this Mel Mel. I'm going to cut off the crown. And the base. Stand our pineapple up. And remove the skin. That having been done, it's just a question of how we want to slice and dice these up. Let's start by cutting it somewhat kind of sort of in half. And starting with the small one, we can cut them into little wedges. <laughs> that one was kind of juicy. And then cut our little to smaller slices. Again, be very careful. And if you want to give those more of a rough chop, Please feel free. And we will now get that into one of our straining bags, which is always kind of fun because these things are definitely on the slippery side. <laughs> like I said, always kind of fun. Now in this part of the process, we're going to chop up those raisins. It doesn't have to be a fine chop, but a good rough chop will do it. Now the raisins, of course, are being used to add a little additional flavor and body to the wine. It's not being used as a yeast nutrient, although if it does provide any sort of nutritional value to the uh, 
to the metal mill, that would be fine by me. Okay, that should be good enough. And we'll go ahead and get those in the bags. All right, we want to go ahead and zest one of our oranges. And let's go ahead and get those in one of our straining bags. Oop. All we need to do now is just tie the bags off and get them ready for the pot. All right, at this stage of the operation, we just want to do a couple of simple things. We want to start the process of our tan and substitute. Drop in our black tea bag and pour in about, I don't know, about half a cup of water. No need to be precise. We can go ahead and put a cover on that. And as far as our remaining water is concerned, got to remember we've got three bottles of honey that we're adding to this. So we're going to add about oh, roughly half of our water. Or thereabouts. Let's put a cover on that and let's bring this up to a boil. As far as our tea mixture is concerned, we want to bring that up to a simmer. We don't want to bring that up to a boil because if we forget about it, we start looking in the pot, we got nothing but tea particles floating all around and we don't want that. So just bring it up to a simmer. All right, now that our water has had a chance to come up to a nice, good boil. Careful, it's hot. We're going to go ahead and add our fruit. And the next thing we want to do is we're going to go ahead and add in our tea slash tannin substitute. Go ahead and Turn off the heat and all we need to do really is make sure that our fruit is down in there and let's just go ahead and put our cover on and we're going to let this let the temperature come down quite a bit because the next thing we want to do is that we want to go ahead and add in our honey so while this is co uh, cooling down a bit we're going to go ahead and put our honey in uh, some hot water so it will flow a bit more easily. And then uh, we'll come back to it. All right, now that our pineapple orange mixture has come down a little bit in temperature, I mean, it's still, it's still a bit hot. I mean, you can put your hand on it and leave it there. So it's kind of like real warm sort of thing. We're going to go ahead and incorporate our honey and our brown sugar. Speaking of which, let's move the brown sugar where we'll do some good. Now again, as I said earlier, we had the brown, we had the honey sitting in um, hot water, changed it twice to make it easier to flow. Not that everything's gonna come out of the bottle, but we're gonna rinse the bottles out and get make sure we got all of that in high pain, expensive honey in the pot where we'll do the most good. Now again, the purpose of putting the fruit into the hot water was just primarily to help kill off any stray bacteria that might have made its way on there. 
and to some degree kill off any harmful bacteria. Since we're not using sulfites, every little bit helps. The cover back on and allow it to come down to room temperature before moving on to the next step. Now that our juice has come down to room temperature, we're going to do a couple of things. One, we're going to transfer everything from our pot into our fermenter. I've had varying degrees of success, but I do know that I am going to take the fruit out first, put them in a separate bowl, and then pour in the liquid. That will give me a good idea as to just how much actual juice I've got and how much additional water I'm going to need to add. All right, let's see how good I am this time. Not bad. The trick is to remove the fruit first. Now we can go ahead and drop our fruit back in. This is usually when it gets... Oh, you're right. I stand corrected. Before putting in our fruit, I'm going to add in the remainder, or nearly the remainder of our water to bring us up to at least one gallon or four liters, depending on how you look at it, in our fermenter. I've already got that level marked off. That gives me one gallon, which leaves me with, oh, I don't know, about a cup of water left. Now, actually, I'm going to add in oh, about half a cup. So it should give me about half a cup extra at the end, which when I rack it in the secondary, I can then take the remainder above the least layer and freeze it and use that in subsequent rackings to make up the difference and reduce the amount of head space. So those go in. And now we can go ahead and add in our oranges and lemon. All right, we can now begin the process of adding our acid blend substitute, which will give our melon meal a little bit of brightness at the end. And we can now go ahead and add that to the fermenter. All right, once you've got in as much as you're going to get, our next step is going to be to take a hydrometer reading. All right, looks like our hydrometer reading is coming in at 1.072. Okay, we're gonna take the opportunity to give this a real good vigorous stir. And the reason for that is to incorporate uh, some additional oxygen into the mix. And, uh, Instead of uh, just mixing things up as is being now, done now, you really want to give it a good vigorous, let's whip up some oxygen into the mix kind of stir. Now another way of doing it would be to do it like this. I mean, seriously, we're talking about... Let's, 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 let's get some air in there. Because that yeast is going to need this additional oxygen to help it out and breathe a little bit. Now, actually, over the course of the next three days, 
you want to give it again a good vigorous stir and kind of punch down and kind of squeeze out uh, the bags, the straining bags using your, your spoon. But right now we really want to just give it a little bit more oxygen. And now we can go ahead and begin the process of adding in our yeast. We're going to be using a quarter of a yeast. And although sometimes it does happen, it did not get included in the uh, in ingredients section of the, of the video, but I'm using a Red Star Premier Blanc wine yeast, quarter of a teaspoon. And just sprinkle that around without dumping it all in one spot. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, uh, sometimes you've seen me uh, hydrate the yeast beforehand. Generally, you'll see me when making most of my wines. I'll just go ahead and just uh, do as what we just saw here, just sprinkling it across the top. It does tend to get hydrated on its own. Whatever makes you happy, go for it. And all we need to do now is a couple of things. One, we want to put on our cap. And then we want to label it. Now, again, this particular fermenter does have its own built-in airlock, so I don't need to incorporate one. Uh, so that'll take care of that. But definitely, when we do rack this in the secondary, we will need an airlock to let CO2 escape. So let's go ahead and label this, and then we can wrap this video up. Now one of the last things we need to do is that we need to label our creation with some basic information. What we want to know is a couple of things. Okay, I guess that will be close enough. Uh, we are making a pineapple orange melomel. We started it on this date. And our original gravity reading was 1.072. Now all we need to do is to put it aside again. Let's so fucking zoom out here a little bit. Is to oops, sorry. Yeah. Is that uh, for the next uh, three days at least, come back in and uh, again give it a, a good vigorous little stir to get some more oxygen to the mix. Again, we are not using any yeast energizers or yeast nutrients, so that little bit of oxygen is generally all that I've been able to do and get my means to work successfully. Uh, after that, you can just go ahead and leave it alone. After five to seven days, your choice, you can go ahead and remove the fruit and rack it into your secondary and continue on the fermentation process from there, which should last uh, several more months and after usually I'll let it go for about 12 months is that I find that to be a sweet spot for most of my wines and, mel and meats uh, we'll go ahead and uh, degas it if necessary we'll back sweeten it if necessary uh, we'll then bottle it and usually I am now pasteurizing my wines just to be on the safe side better safe than sorry uh, and there we go that's the process for making an orange I'm sorry a pineapple orange melomel uh, for at a very very simplistic level uh, once you've gotten this part down pat, then you can advance to more advanced techniques in your in your wines and needs making. One. Okay, it's been 12 months. It's now time to try out our pineapple orange melomel. See how it turned out. Uh, a couple of observations. One. One thing I learned when doing the bottle egg for this particular batch was that you really shouldn't fill it up all the way up to near the top of the neck. You really should bring it down a little bit because when I corked it, there was enough air pressure that built up where it started to pop out the cork, uh, which is not a good thing. I could probably not pull it out, but using the old corkscrew, move this out the way, I'm going to go ahead and Pop this cork. There we go. And let's go ahead and it's a very little get that out the way. Okay. 
Now from the onset, I can also say that this bottle of wine was not properly degassed. I'm surprised it made it through the pasteurization process, which by the way, I should point out, uh, it did come up with a rather low ABV of 10.5%. Hmm. But judging from the little stream of bottle bubbles coming up, I think this one might have a little bit of effervescence. So let's go ahead and try this one out. <laughs> yeah, you know, funny thing is, is that when I try and do a uh, sparkling wine on purpose, it never really seems to work. When I do it by accident, it's like, oh, oh success, you know? All right, so we're gonna try this one out as a sparkling wine, see what we got. Oh, a couple of other observations before we delve in. I mean, in the glass, it's nearly clear. I mean, there's like a tiny little bit of haze. Uh, I don't know, maybe I should have broke out the champagne glasses for this one. <laughs> um, other observations, one, had not at that time, when I bottled this several months ago, perfected the, the uh, technique. In fact, I didn't use the uh, technique that I now use for pasteurizing uh, meats, which is basically means pasteurizing it in the carboy itself after it's been racked <laughs> one final time, back sweeten one last time, because I like to back sweeten all my stuff. Um, yeah, so it, uh, this was basically pasteurized in the bottle, so all of the solids kind of settled down to the bottom. And when I've pasteurized in the carboy itself and then bottled, uh, most of the stuff is left in the carboy and you end up with a clear, much clearer bottle of wine with very little to no sediment to contend with, causing you to lose a little bit of your wine. However, that being said, uh, what do we end up with? I mean, <laughs> if it tastes good, it tastes good. If it doesn't, then this was all for naught. Here we go. Yep, classic side pose here. You can actually tell on the nose, you get the honey, you get the orange, and you get the pineapple. You actually get the flavors that you put into it on the nose, which is kind of kind of rare sometimes. <laughs> a little bit more back sweetening, but <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yep, a little bit more honey in the back sweetening. Uh, Would have been fine. Uh, don't think I'd do it a bottle back sweetening um, because of the amount of sediment that's in the bottle. But uh, yeah, I could have back sweetened. This is, it's a, it's not, it's a semi-dry wine is how I ended up back sweetening it. Um, which is okay, I mean. That's <coughs> why the bubbles went down the wrong way. <laughs> but yeah. This is actually not bad. Is there any more any fruit more predominant than the other? Pine I put them in this order. One last check to make sure. Pineapple, then orange, and then at the very back end, a very mellow, light honey finish. This is actually pretty decent. I mean. When I'm at, at the store uh, shopping for juice for breakfast, you know, stuff like that, uh, I'll see orange juice and then I'll see pineapple juice and then in between I'll see pineapple orange juice. I always tend to grab the pineapple orange juice as my preferred juice of choice. This tastes almost just like it. In a slightly drier wine format. I mean, I've had a string of wines that, quite frankly, I don't think I'll be making ever again. And some probably won't even finish up the five bottles that I generally tend to make. Uh, there are at least a couple that won't get past that first bottle before I'm contemplating pouring the rest of it down the drain. Uh, but this is not going to be one of them. If I'm looking for something that's kind of dry, although I prefer this in a sweeter, uh, sweeter variant, something that's a bit dry, uh, it's crisp. The flavors are definitely crisp in this one. You can get the pasteurization didn't do any damage to this uh, this wine at all. Um, whether it's a, whether it's a sparkling wine or not, uh, it works. It seems to work. It seems to work. I 
like this. <laughs> Most of the meads that I've made, I generally tend to like. Wines can be, I'd say the majority of the wines that I've made, I generally tend to like. So I'll say it again. Uh, I've got five bottles of this, uh, none of which are showing any signs of that cork coming out as this one did, and that's primarily due to the fact that it was what the uh, level was up so high. Uh, nothing's been pushed out, nothing's been broken. Uh, I think I got away, I got lucky, <laughs> because it is a sparkling wine, uh, using regular wine bottles, which I would not recommend, by the way. But yeah, I mean, I'm not disappointed at all. Hmm. Not disappointed at all. I don't know about bottle sweetening, maybe a little glass sweetening might, might help out just a tad. Um, but there we go. Pineapple, orange, melamil at the 12 month mark. Uh, thank you for watching this video. If you like what you see here, please click on the subscribe and notify buttons. And uh, better yet, become a member. Uh, links to everything that I've used can be found in both the description and comment section of the video. And uh, yeah, if you're looking for something a little bit different, go ahead and give it a try.